Welcome to In The Loop. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of In The Loop. So this episode will be slightly different because this was actually recorded for the Atlanta Jewelry Show, or AJS, and their webinar series. This was on Tuesday, and we were gracious enough to be invited on to sort of demo In The Loop for them. And we invited on Ben Smithy, the CEO and founder of The Smithy Group, and as well as Katie Kinlaw, who is digital marketing manager at Punchmark. And we talked all about what it takes to arm your web presence and a couple different things to focus on. Everything is pretty high level and surface deep, but we decided to kind of cover a lot of ground and allow you guys to dive into other episodes of In The Loop and get a more deep kind of sense for them, uh, just like what we've been covering all season. So please enjoy. And this episode is brought to you by Punchmark, the jewelry industry's leading website provider. Join the community of nearly 500 other jewelry stores in choosing Punchmark's easy to run and e-commerce enabled website platform by visiting punchmark.com for your free trial demo. And this episode is also brought to you by The Smithy Group, a digital growth agency that helps leaders and businesses dream bigger and achieve multi-generational integrity. Through insights and intelligence, digital marketing, and advertising solutions, they help businesses expand their business and grow their revenue. The Smithy Group has helped hundreds of businesses surpass their goals and believe that whatever your business, whatever your story, they'll make it matter to your audience. Thanks again to AJS for having us on and enjoy the show. So welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. For one of these webinars, we send you the link to the presentation and any special materials that our presenters might want to share. And the Atlanta Jewelry Show brings you these webinars. The Atlanta Jewelry Show is a nonprofit that is owned by the exhibitors, and it is their concern and willingness to support our webinar and education series that makes it all possible. So shout out, yay, Atlanta Jewelry Show. And now I'm going to turn off my mic, turn off my video, and turn it over to the three of you. Thank you so much for being here. Awesome. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you so much, Cindy. I really appreciate your time. So guys, maybe what we'll do, Ben and Katie, just while we're kind of getting everybody to know us, I'll just start with like a really quick introduction to what In The Loop is. So In The Loop, for the people that are listening, is a bi-weekly podcast focused around e-commerce in the jewelry industry. I think that we might be one of the first, if not the only, e-commerce podcast in the jewelry industry. I don't think that very many people even knew what podcasts were before we started really kind of diving into it. So this might be a little bit new to you guys. It's just like a talk show, just like a radio show. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, blah, blah, blah. Let's get into this. We're going to talk about how to arm your web presence and what that means, what you should be focusing on if you're going to be having a strong web presence, because it's as important as it's ever been. I think you'd agree, Ben. Yeah, absolutely. I think that when you look at the website, it's it's home base. And I think a lot of people forget that. I think and people are tend to be surprised when they come to us, they're ready to talk digital, they're ready to talk social media, they're ready to talk Google. And we go back to first of saying, hey, well, let's take a first look at first your brand. And the second thing we talk about is how do we express that through the website? And so I think you're right, Mike. It's like, it is home base. It is a number one of where we need to go. I'd say branding is up there, but most retailers have a brand in place. It's how do we take that next level? It's how do we exude and exhibit the brand successfully on the website. Absolutely. And it's not just so, again, that's 1A, but it's also number or 1B, I guess. Katie can talk about this. It's kind of, once you have a great car, you got to put great gas into it. Otherwise, you just have like a, a nice sculpture on your front lawn. So Katie, maybe you can touch about why it's so important to be having great digital marketing and driving traffic to your website. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it's important too to understand the purpose of your website first before you're really talking about marketing strategy in general, right? Is it more for educational purposes or is it more with the intent of pushing e-commerce as well? So I think you have to determine which kind of focus you want to work on, you know, and then get your website where it needs to be. And then from there, you know, utilizing these resources and generating traffic. And there's tons of different ways that you can do that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth. But, you know, once you have and you've worked on this asset, how do you then get the most out of it and ultimately that's going to be digital marketing. 
Yeah. I think yeah. Ben really put right in front of me when he said, you know, there's two parts, there's content and there's consumption. And I thought that was, I'm going to steal that and probably say it a million more times. So content is going to be um, things that you've written. And a lot of our websites come with pre-written material in it. So this could be things like jewelry education. So informing your buyers why they should be getting your particular engagement ring, because in an online space, just I'm sure you guys are very far aware is the option to go elsewhere is always present. They can always have the option to go to a different website or to a big box store. So it's educating them about why your place is that full of experts and full of real market leaders and then consumption. So this is things like the product that's right on your website. You guys are probably really well aware of things like product images. So we partner with Pickup Media's Gem Lightbox. So you can have great photos of your jewelry because in the end, jewelry is the most aesthetic product out there. I love how creative people get with, you know, taking gifts of the jewelry, rotating or the necklaces on great mannequins and whatnot. But it also has other things in it. So like jewelry, I want to know, you know, how quality is the metal? How quality is the diamond selection or the cuts? And educating the folks, not just by saying, you know, hey, we are this, you know, bracelet is several thousand dollars. It's why is this jewelry several thousand dollars and why you should get it as well. So it kind of comes in as a two-part piece. And sometimes folks only focus on one and not actually both where they should be. Ben, we were just catching up on uh, content <laughs> consumption. No worries. We'll be right on in. Keep on moving. Maybe we can also talk about how there are actually different kind of prongs to your web presence. And we can kind of start with like the homepage. So Ben, what are you looking at when you are trying to break down like what a good homepage strategy is? So I think the first thing when it comes to homepages, people need to look at this as sort of a digital retail establishment, right? I think especially in our industry, everybody understands the retail space. Everybody understands what's important in the retail environment. It's clean, it's presentable, it's inviting, it's, uh, it showcases the goods well, all of those assets. But then sometimes when we go to a website, our mind like blanks out and we don't think about any of those items. Yeah. And your homepage is the first place that people are going to be if they're, especially if they're searching, likely they're going to go to, you know, outside of landing pages, which I think are probably equally as important as your homepage. We'll go there in a second, but your homepage needs to be clean and concise, right? On mobile, you have three to five seconds at most to get somebody to where they need to go and make that next move. Otherwise they're going to bounce off. So it needs to be mobile friendly. You got to think mobile first today in the jewelry world. And then second of all, I think it needs to be more human. And I think this is where brands are really missing the mark a lot of times is how do we show the human nature of our brands? Because if you look at one jewelry store to the next, the difference is the people, right? Most jewelry stores, I would say, you know, at least 50 to 75% of them carry similar goods as another jewelry store, right? It's not completely all custom jewelry, but you need to, and at its core basics, it's still rings, bracelets, earrings, you know, necklaces. So you need to show a way to differentiate yourself. And that's by your brand. And the best brand is your human brand. And I think showing your team, showing your personality, what it's like, that builds trustworthiness, that builds, you know, sort of that friendly, inviting, warm atmosphere Absolutely. that shows yeah. who you are. You know, I think I've talked with Kitty about this, but sometimes it's, um, everybody has that story. If you ask any jewelers about their business, so tell me, how did so-and-so's uh, Michael's Jewelry start? They have the most incredible stories. You know, oh, we uh, went out to buy this thing and this thing, and then we uh, hired this person. Yeah. Tell that story. Like, why aren't you putting that on there? That is really interesting. And that's what differentiates you from those big box retailers or the folks down the road. You know, telling the, or putting a face with the name, you know, showing what the owners look like or showing what the inside of the store looks like really decked out for an event. Really like, I feel like a lot of people are shortchanging themselves by not actually adding that in there. Right. Yeah. And then the back end pieces and Katie, you can go into this. Like there's key elements that need to be on the homepage when it comes to even how you have your title set up, your content on there, all the back end data of the site too. That's equally as important. I'm just talking about front of the house, the stuff that people see, but the yeah. back end has to be just as clean and organized as well. Yeah, absolutely. And going into the human element, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a credibility 
you know, builder, right? And, you know, people are going to you outside of the big box stores because they want that experience. So how do you make sure that you're highlighting that, you know, that much more in depth? And we'll talk more about like the technical components of things when we're um, discussing the different pieces of marketing as well. But I think that it's important to kind of touch base on the homepage, but also transition into the overall customer journey, right? And how are you utilizing your website to the best of its ability? You know, you want to make sure that you're showcasing your top priorities on your homepage, right? So not every jeweler is going to be the same. Maybe you have specific brands that are important to you. Some uh, jewelers are more into custom versus not, um, you know, gemstone jewelry, et cetera. So making sure that you have those priorities on the homepage. And then from there, where are you then leading the user to? And that's where we start talking about landing pages. How do we nice. utilize yep. category splash pages and ultimately how that funnels the user where you want them to go? Because majority of people are going to land on your homepage, like, you know, Ben mentioned too. How do you then get them to where you want them to go and with intent, right? So I don't know if we want to talk a little bit more in depth about uh, landing page strategies. Yeah. Well. Maybe we can just like let's boil it right down to the bottom. Yeah. What is a landing page? Like, let's, let's get that out of the way. And there's a chance that someone doesn't know. Yeah, so a landing page is, for us, it can be a, a, a page that's mapped out. Technically, you could send them to there. But technically, a lot of these are custom pages that you build on your website for a specific purpose to capture and funnel them through. So I think of my homepage as like a traffic circle, right? You get them nice. to come into there, and they're circling around, circling around, and you want them to exit in a certain direction, right? So it needs to be clear And we've all been in traffic circles that are well-marked, and we've all been in traffic circles that are not well-marked. Right. And so yes. the well-marked ones, it's easy to exit right where you need to. And that's what we want. For a landing page, we're trying to avoid the traffic circle and skip them right to where we know we want to go. So for example, I see a bridal and engagement ad because they're serving at me. They see, say they're looking for a 21 to 25 year old unmarried male serves me an engagement ring ad. Boom. I see it. I'm interested in it. And I click that ad. Well, it makes no sense if I'm clicking a very specific ad about diamond engagement rings to send me to a homepage to where then I got to go find where I need to go. It makes more sense to click that, send me to a page on the website that may be, you know, smithiesjewelers.com slash diamonds for dudes right? And all of a sudden I hit the Diamonds for Dudes landing pages. And that landing page shows me specific content made just for that content. So it may show, hey, I may even reference that ad. Hey, you clicked on the ad that you just saw. And I want to talk to you a little bit more about what Smithy's Jewelers engagement ring buying process Education. is yep. and information just for you dudes out there. And then I have more content. I have some calls to action of where I want them to go next to search styles, make an appointment, yada, yada, yada. So we use those types of what we call landing pages, which is basically a on like menued page on the website to get people exactly where we want them to go to like sort of bypass everything else. And you can also be even in a different direction with like creating uh, category landing pages. So yeah. what Ben was mentioning was unlisted ones. So that's great. And that could be specifically for type of traffic, but you could also have things like for earrings. You know, if I, in my mind as the shopper and I close my eyes and I say, I need a pair of earrings. Well, I could be thinking of studs and you could be thinking of hoops and we're both right, but maybe we need to get there in two different ways. So if I put up a landing page and you say, I want to buy earrings, you go through it and then it gives you a different spot with a whole bunch of visual examples. So for example, then it says, Hey, what kind of earrings are you thinking of? We know that we got a difference of opinion. Here's some studs, chandeliers, hoop, blah, blah, blah. Give them the option. And then when they click through hoop earrings, then they present you with nine hoop earrings. There you go. Because you could have, you know, 500 earrings, but if they're not, if they're all diamond studs and I'm looking for hoops, you might as well have zero. It doesn't actually matter. I'm looking for hoop earrings. Put me in front of those ones that I want. And the chance of me shopping out is a lot higher. And technically, strategically, the landing page is really the next step to getting them to product specific decisions. I'd say when I go to the landing page, I want my next step to be get them the product or get them to book an appointment. Some sort of direct call to action. That's basically the next step to purchase. I see the landing pages. Here I am. I have one more step, which is either viewing specific products or making an appointment. And then boom, I'm at the purchase standpoint. That's how I view most landing pages. Unless it's some sort of direct call to action where sometimes we use that landing page as a direct close page. That works a lot mainly on e-commerce sites where we see them, we're, we're funneling them in and all of a sudden, boom, landing page convert right on the landing page. Yeah. Uh, for a lot of retail jewelry, it's mainly the next step away from a purchase. But what about product pages? So you just mentioned it. Katie, I'll put this one to you. What are you looking for when you 
you say a product page, like uh, what does that mean in like the grand scheme of the, the checkout funnel? Yeah, I think that there's a couple of boxes that need to be checked really from a best practice standpoint, right? So we can kind of break it down into two sections here. So I think one is going to be the imagery side of things. And we already talked about how important, you know, really great imagery is for selling products online. And we've even talked about this before too, is, you know, sometimes we'll be working with jewelers and they'll take pictures directly through like the case. Don't do that. Don't do that, people. If you have those, go back, read reshoot your photos, put them back in there. There you go. Uh, That's your PSA. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like I understand that um, that's just kind of been the norm up until this point, but with the way that the industry is shifting, you need really beautifully shot products, especially if you're looking to push e-commerce. Right. Um, And then not only just like one beautiful shot, but, you know, having multiple angles, even having a video, like we mentioned with the gem light box and having that carousel um, snippet too is, is really neat. And then even going a step further, if you have the ability and actually take pictures with people wearing the items, you know what I mean? Like I know for myself and for a lot of research that we've done is people are that much more likely to convert by seeing the product on an actual person too. So how do you then like utilize all of these imagery pieces to really beautifully showcase again, multiple angles, having some sort of video and then having like a lifestyle shot is really key um, from a product perspective. And then then we can kind of shift into um, the description side of things and how are you then describing and you know giving the information specifically in terms of carrot weight um you know metal type you know everything that kind of comes with that not just saying diamond engagement ring but what's the setting you know what's the carrot weight like you know be as descriptive as possible because it's not only going to help the user then want to purchase because they're educated about what they're actually buying but it's good from an seo perspective as well which we'll talk a little bit more in depth about too yeah, yeah, I think the measure of a good product page is it gives me everything I need to know to make a purchase, right? At the end of the question, it's like, it's, that's the checkbox. That's the ultimate stress test of the product page is like, what questions does the consumer have to make a purchase? Mm-hmm. And if there are questions, there's a good chance that you can answer those strategically on a product page nowadays with all the features that are out there, you know? Yeah. And I guess that goes to show and you know, Katie was mentioning having product shots on models. So it doesn't actually have to be a model. It could just be someone at your office when the number of people, uh, customers in your store is low, grab a good camera, or if you have an iPhone, trust me, those things are just as good as like a a DSLR or something like that. Just about get a good background and then have them try on, you know, this section of the display case, take a photo, take a photo, take a photo. And then you can use those in your product pages, but you can also use those on social media and then tag them with the correct product. And I think this ties in perfectly, Katie. Let's talk about the way that you can start marketing into your website, because first we have the website is all beautiful and looking great and ready for checkout. How do we get people to actually go there and start viewing your products? Yeah, absolutely. And when we're talking about digital marketing, we can kind of lump it into individual buckets and we'll touch base on those kind of high level as well. So number one is going to be search engine optimization. So that's essentially um, how do you tailor the website to be more favorable to Google to show up in the search results from an organic perspective. Then we can transition into um, the paid side of things. So paid ads through Google, as well as paid ads through Facebook and Instagram. And then there's more of the organic in-depth social strategy and, you know, curating a community and building followers through social media as well. So I know we want to kind of break that down and touch base on each of those a little bit more in depth as well. So maybe we'd start with SEO because I feel like SEO has been this uh, nimbulous idea out there that everybody kind of has like a little bit of smoke and mirrors. It seems like no one really knows what it is. Katie, can you break down just for the people at home? What is SEO and how can you start tracking to see if what they're doing is actually working. Yes. So um, when we're talking about search engine optimization and really boiling it down, you can consider, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about the individual factors that tie into the magical algorithm that helps you rank in Google. And I'll break that down into four individual sections. So number one is going to be the technical components of your site. So I'm sure you've all um, kind of heard a lot of the buzz in the industry recently about like page speed, making sure that the page speed is where it needs to be. Um, You know, the actual like user experience on the site, four or four pages, making sure that the technical foundation is where it needs to be. 
And then it's going to be offsite factors similar to, you know, Google my business listings, right? Like, do you have a lot of really great reviews? Um, you know, because that's an important factor for Google as well as the proximity of the user. If you're a local brick and mortar, obviously where you're physically located is going to impact the search results as well. And then we transition into uh, talking about content. And that really is kind of the bread and butter and the cornerstone of um, search engine optimization is do you have the right content on the site, the right keywords that's going to help Google understand your site is relevant for a specific you know, keyword phrase. So do you rank for jewelry stores in your area? Do you rank for engagement rings in your area? Do you have the appropriate content, landing pages, blog posts, you know, um, a service, you know, images um, or what do you mean, content? What do you mean by rank? Can you explain that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when I'm referencing um, ranking in uh, Google, I'm talking about, you know, um, let's start from the very beginning. You open up a browser and you go to Google and you search in a specific keyword phrase, right? So this example, we can use um, just like jewelry store near me. So you open up your browser, you go to Google, you search, um, you know, jewelry store near me. You then see those listings on the actual page itself, right? So one through 10 is going to be the first page. So when I'm referencing rank, I more mean where are you then ranking in those actual listings. So ranking being number one is going to be the top of Google, 10 and below is going to be tens at the bottom of the page and then beyond. Obviously, the higher you are in Google, the more traffic you're hopefully going to get, the more traffic you get, essentially the more business and more eyes on your on your brand. There's a joke. I got to say the joke. I love this joke. Where's the best place to hide a dead body? It's page two of Google because <laughs> it's because rank one garners, I want to say 90% of clicks and then rank two garners like seven and then all the rest of them are like the remaining like 1% or something like that. It's if you're not there, you're, you got to work on it and there you go. Right. Yeah. So again, just kind of super high level, and then we can transition on to the next topic. You know, I think number one, you need to understand if you have the appropriate content on your site and then making sure that you have the appropriate landing pages that discuss each of those focuses. Do you have a dedicated page for custom jewelry? Do you have a dedicated page for engagement rings and making sure that you have all of those priorities on your site and also make sure that you're focusing on reviews and making sure that you're curating that as well, because those are going to be the two biggest pieces that you can directly impact. And then you can get into the more technical components as you, you know, kind of learn and go along here as well. Ben, not losing any speed. Let's get into paid social. I know that this is a huge focus for the Smithy Group, what we call the, uh, the experts on this one. What can you tell us about that? Yeah. So I look at when page search is, is really looking around, you know, searching the like solving an answer. I look at paid social as planting a seed, right? It has some of the unique characteristics of paid search where it's really going off of behavioral based characteristics and patterns, but it's more so how do I get people in the discovery zone, right? So they're in an outer circle when they're, they're searching for something, but where I look at discovery is how do I create that gravitational pull into that circle? right into orbit. Yeah. So if they're already circling the orbit, they're going to be in search. I want to create paid social as this gravitational pull to get people into that orbit, to get them into something on their mind or planting that seed. So paid social looks like sponsored posts on Instagram, Facebook, promoted pins on Pinterest, you name it there. We even consider it, you know, pre-roll on YouTube. It's, it's sort of the hybrid between paid social and then search display. But paid social is really important and it goes way beyond just what used to be promoted promoting or boosting posts, right? Matter of fact, we when we run ads, we don't ever run any ads from the front end of Facebook or Instagram. Everything's done through Ad Manager. There's several types and we have content on other episodes of the podcast or we will have episodes that are focused specifically on all the different types of, of these. And we can go through all of these in detail. We could do a whole hour of just the different ad types because there's dozens of them. Yes. Right now we see instant experience ads. If you're not familiar with those, go to Facebook, Instagram and look in their blueprint or just Google instant experience ads and see something on YouTube. They can talk through what instant experience ads are, but they work a lot with your website pixel, which basically tracks user patterns and user behavior, as well as the demographics from the information that Facebook has on you. When I say Facebook, I'm talking about Facebook and Instagram and serves them ads that have things like dynamic product ads, 
catalogs. You can attach your catalog of all your products into the ad. So we can serve dynamic products, ads to the customers that have been searching on your site and those that could potentially search for these items. Uh, there's a number of different ways that you can use paid social right now to get them into your orbit, to serve someone that's you know right in your demographic or your category and get them to your site. I'd say there's a lot of targeting around either geographic, demographic, or psychographic slash behavioral interest patterns. Those are the key three sort of areas that you can target in and sort of that trifecta. And that's that's what we're looking at. We're trying to get the perfect mix of content and messaging and imagery, right? All of that together mapped back to your audience. So it's sort of this scientific experiment algorithm of how do we match image, content, with the audience and we're running five, six, seven, a dozen different variations to try to go fishing for those people. And I guess it all works together. Like we were talking about, it's not just enough to have a, you know, kick butt SEO plan or you could be spending tons of money on ads. Um, you could be spending a ton of money on, you know, your website, but if no one's going to it, then it doesn't matter. And if you don't have a great website and you pay all this money for social, it really doesn't matter. So you've got to have kind of peanut butter and jelly on this one. And and I yeah. think it's, oh, sorry, yeah, after you. No, I was just going to say the, the perfect, a very, very, and I'd say high likelihood there could be two different main paths. So I'm searching for diamond engagement rings near me. Boom, I find it. I hit the site, hit the landing page, watch a video, go to check out because most places, most people today are checking out multiple sites and stuff. I leave the site, bam, because they were on the site and pixeled, I remarket them with a, a Facebook or an Instagram ad. That's a video. It really captures them on it. They go back to the site and they make an appointment or vice versa. They may not be searching for me. They may have searched for another store, but because they're interested in jewelry now, we serve them a targeted Facebook ad that they haven't been able to, they hadn't seen the brand before. They look at a brand video. They're impacted by that brand video. They come back later and they're thinking, oh, what was that? Smithy's Jewelers, search it in, type for the search bar, come to it through an organic search, hit the site, convert. Either one of those pathways, I would say, would cover 90, 95% of traffic today to your yeah. website that are gonna be your customers. It's really just gassing up your website and think about if someone is going and they're shopping for a gift for their mm -hmm. significant other. Well, you want them to come to your website or what if they're just searching for a gift? Well, now they went to your website once. Well, you should tell them, hey, jewelry is the right gift for you. And then they come to your store. And it's like, you can see how the end user behavior is what we're trying to impact. And if you're creative and you're clever, these things are proven. These are proven track records. I mean, Katie has all the all the data that you could ever love to, to look at. I think it's really interesting. It's a real really cool tool that's out there right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's kind of a good transition to talk about, I think, paid as an umbrella. So we, you know, Ben did a really great job in breaking down paid social, but also touching base on, you know, paid uh, SEM directly through Google as well. You know, and we mentioned um, rankings in the search results, and that's specifically tailored to the organic searches. So how is Google identifying different sites as relevant for a keyword that a user is searching, like the example that we use, jewelry store near me? But even above that on the search results, there's a section for paid ads. And the way that that works is it's similar to paid social where we can go after specific locations, demographics, you know, different components of that nature. But it's then serving them ads directly above uh, the organic listings, essentially referencing pay-per-click. So we're bidding on specific keywords. Then whenever we're targeting people that fit under the demographics that we're going after, how do we then generate traffic directly through those ads. If they click on an ad, we direct them to a landing page, then obviously we're charged a very um, small amount. What's kind of cool, just kind of a side note, Facebook, you tend to get a little bit more bang for your buck because the cost per click is a little bit lower typically for social than it is for, um, for Google. But we have to look at the different intent of the user, right? And yeah. we're looking at integrated marketing as a whole. And how are we utilizing each of these pieces to work together to get to that endpoint, that conversion that we're looking for, whether it's coming in the store, filling out a form or making a purchase on the site. You know, so we have to think about how are we utilizing all of these pieces to work together at the end of the day. Yeah. 99.9% .9 of our clients are, are doing both and always, do right. that, you know, yeah. So I think that this is kind of, it just goes to show there's a wide world out there. And I think it would take a lifetime to learn 
everything. So that's kind of one of those things. It's you've got to choose where your battles are and then you need to either consider consulting with someone or kind of just letting something come back to it. But again, remember your website is never a completed project and your business is never a complete project. It's always a work in progress. You're always going to need to be updating your copy, updating your imagery, using, you know, holiday imagery or seasonal imagery, you know, making it so that when the summer comes, you use pictures of people going to the beach instead of people going camping in a log cabin while the snow comes down. There's a slightly different feel that you're trying to generate. So I guess maybe we can wrap with the jeweler industry is a kind of a wide space. I think that we're starting to see a huge push towards e-commerce. This year has been, I can only speak for Punchmark and I can only speak for what I've seen. And we have um, a channel that we can see whenever a a website, that's one of ours, uh, makes a a sale. And it has been off the absolute hook since, well, since quarantine started, but this entire year in general. I don't think that all the online sales are directly only due to people being stuck at home a lot more, but I definitely don't think it hurt. And I think that people have all of this money that's hanging around that they are trying to show that they love each other. And I think that you're finding that people are looking online for new ways to express their love. And that's why this is why you got to have a serious, uh, you know, web presence. So wow, well, that's, a, that's amazing. Go. All they have covered. And uh, <laughs> you, you talk so fast. I'm glad we have this recorded. You do have a question. Do you have any recommendations for getting page speeds up? As a jewelry store, having lots of large, beautiful images does hurt the page speed. So any recommendations there? Yeah. So, you know, ultimately, I think number one is going to be determining where are the areas of opportunity for page speed. Normally, nine times out of 10, it's going to be compressing images on your site. Um, You'd mentioned, you know, having lots of product images, you know, the amount that is on your site is going to be pretty significant. So how can you still have really great resolution of photos, but also compressing, you know, the actual weight of the image as much as you can? That's normally going to be your best bet there. So if you have like a a 3000 pixel image and it's being served, meaning displayed at 500 pixels, you should probably have it down to right around 500 pixels because otherwise the computer has to load that, shrink it, and then serve it up. Um, At Punchmark, we actually have a tool. This is really cool. That's called the image optimizer. And what it does is it checks to see how big it is and then it pushes Mm -hmm. it to a a cloud storage space. And then when it pushes down, it loads a lot quicker. So it's, you have a a lot of different options at your hands. Yeah, but I would agree that right sizing resolutions is like a number one. Yeah, for sure. My gosh, so much, so much to consider. And I was looking at uh, the big survey in In in-store magazine. I know the new October one is coming out now, Mm -hmm. but it's interesting to ask how long has it been since you updated your website? Two years or less, 80%, which I was surprised. That's that's pretty good for our slow to adopt industry. We've got 15 at five years. We've got 3% at 10 years. And oh my gosh, we've got 2% at 15 years or more. Guys, let's go. Got some work to do out there, friends. And uh, I'm glad to have been able to introduce you to my friends here. And make sure you check out the podcast. And if uh, one of you will send us the a link or information for the podcast, when we send out this video, we'll include that. Love to do that. And I think we'll have to have you back. And uh, That would be awesome. We'll have to slow you down. <laughs> you really <laughs> slow you down. You've really covered a lot. And maybe the three of you can decide on something you may as a team want to focus on. Or maybe we give you individually a chance to take us more into the weeds on this. Because there's a lot, lot to learn and we haven't been doing our homework. And thank yeah. you in store for keeping us on top of that. And uh, what I would like to say, any more questions? Let's have it. Oh, yeah, we've got the uh, thank you, Michael, for putting the link to the podcast there. I would like to tell everyone that we did have a great show in October. Michael, you were there. Katie, you were there. 
And it was successful, it was safe, and it felt really good to awesome. see people other than on a screen. And I want <laughs> you to mark your calendars for March 6th through 8th, which will be the next Atlanta Jewelry Show. And of course, I'll have the conference day on the 5th. And we're looking at doing uh, hands-on and uh, demos as the education during the show. So we keep everybody on the show floor, the energy going and information being shared. And I'm, I'm sure hoping that you guys will be there. And we'll also have an August show as well. Awesome. But thank you all for being here. My pals, my friends, thank you so much for being here. Awesome. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you so much, Cindy. I really appreciate your time. Guys, I think we'll call it right there. Thanks everybody for listening to this episode of In The Loop. Talk to you next week. Bye. All right, everybody. That's the end of the show. Thank you so much for listening. And a very special thank you to Cindy at AJS for inviting us on to kind of demo in the loop for them. I hope that the listeners got something out of this. Uh, very special thank you to our guests, Ben and Katie, for their time. You guys can get in touch with Punchmark at punchmark.com or the Smithy Group at thesmithygroup.com. Thanks, everybody. See you on the next one. Bye.